I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 3. And this is an amazing chapter in the Bible. It's describing the downfall of the nation of Israel. And you can think about your country or your family, your church, your organization, anything. This will show you the downfall of a nation or of anything. And let's just jump right into it. The first thing is, when you see the downfall of something, you're going to see the elimination of men. And when I say men, I mean not just males, I mean real good men. You get rid of the real good men, that's when you know things are going down. It says in verse 1, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah. Jerusalem, the place, Judah, the people. He's going to take away from them the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Well, you're wondering what stay means. Well, right there it just showed you. You didn't have to go just a few words later and it said the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So their, their life support, their stay of bread, their stay of water. So he is the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and he is the Lord of all the host of heaven, the stars. He's the Lord of the stars, the angels. He's the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2.10. And he's got the power to take away, and he's going to take away their stay, their stay of bread and their stay of water, and their staff. Well, you're wondering, what's, what's their staff? What does that mean? Like a, like a shepherd's staff? Well, no, here it's talking about the stay and the staff is the means by which their, their life is being supported with. The only reason you are still alive is because God's letting you live. He could cut off all your food and water supply tomorrow. But the Lord is justified in taking away your stay and your staff because he, he's the one that gave it to you in the first place. In Job 121, it says, Job says this, he says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So when he, take, when he takes away the stay and the staff, he's just in doing so. He's the one that gave it to you. He can take it away just as quick as he gave it. Now notice how you can interpret the Bible with the Bible without the need of having to correct it or update it. If you don't know what it means when it says staff in Isaiah 3, 1, search it. Search it through the scriptures. Look at what the other scriptures say that have the word in it. For example, Ezekiel 4 and verse 16, it says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. Notice that, the staff of bread. And they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment. So right there it says staff of bread. Showing you the staff has to do with their bread and water, their life support. And it makes sense. We can also go to Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, matching the third chapter of Isaiah. Remember I told you Isaiah's got 66 chapters. Your Bible has 66 books. Each one of Isaiah's chapters will line up with each book of the Bible. Levitic, uh, Isaiah chapter 3 will line up with Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. Look at Leviticus 26.26. 26. It says, And when I have broken the staff, there that word is, the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. So you see that? The stay and the staff has to do with their life support, their bread, their water. The Lord's going to take it away. There's going to be a famine. So he says, Isaiah 3, 1 and 2, through 2. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. The mighty man, 
Now here's the elimination of men, the great men. He's going to take away the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient. So a nation, a family, or anything will crumble when you take away the men who act like men. This world wants to replace the mighty man with weak men. The world wants to replace the mighty man with strong women. You see in the stories and the movies and the books today, who's the hero now? The woman. The woman comes in and saves her tied up husband from the bad man. This ruins the picture of the man, Christ Jesus, coming in to rescue the bride. This ruins the picture of the man Christ Jesus coming back at the second coming on a white horse to save Israel. You see, back when I was a kid, you would never see. It was always in the cartoons, the games, the movies. It was always a manly man hero coming in to save Israel his bride or his girlfriend or whatever it was. It, you never saw it the other way around. Now they want to make the men more feminine and soft. They want to make the woman more masculine. They want to get things out of order. But the man cannot be the woman, and the woman cannot be the man. God made it that way for a reason, and they want to break, break this down. When you break this down, you're going to see the downfall of a nation or of anything so the men of war if you take away the mighty men of war and replace them with effeminate men do you think the enemy army is going to be intimidated no they're not going to be intimidated of a bunch of men who act like women think about it like when you were a kid especially if you're a guy what was the worst thing that could ever happen to you? Well, when I was a kid, it was, you didn't want to get beat by a girl in anything. In arm wrestling, in basketball, tug of war, whatever it was, you didn't want to get beat by a girl. Now, you see seeing that everywhere. Now you got, you got guys dressing up like girls wanting to compete against other girls. That's how twisted it has become. And that's, the sh that's showing the downfall of a nation or of anything. If you take away the mighty men, the man of war, and replace them with weak men or strong women, it's going downhill. If you take away the godly prophet, it says... It says he's going to take away the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, and the prophet. If you take away the judge. You know, we done talked about <clears throat> a few chapters before. In Isaiah chapter 1, you need judgment, godly judgment. You take away the godly judgment, the man who can make godly judgment, everybody's just going to do what's right in their own eyes. You take away the godly prophet. And replace him with a false prophet you're going to have a bunch of guys going around telling you what you want to hear just like they were with uh, you know with Jehoshaphat and they brought in all those false prophets and here came in Micaiah and he's not telling them what they wanted to hear what did they want to do with him they wanted to lock him away but he had Ahab had all those false prophets just telling him what he wanted to hear and if you take away the godly prophet, who's going to keep people in line and remind them of the Lord? Every man will begin to do what's right in his own eyes. If you take away the prudent, you know, the wise men, the smart men, and I mean really wise, really smart men, not worldly wisdom, but real wisdom, you take them away, then you're going to have a whole bunch of people with twisted thinking who think backwards like liberals. They think illogical, and they think very twisted-like. Everything they say, it's like you talk to them, and you can't, 
You cannot even have a real conversation because they don't know how to reason. They don't know how to just the analogies they use and things that they say is so twisted. You just can't predict what they're going to say next. It's just nonsense. They think so illogically. For example, a woman, I just heard this the other day, a woman was suing her parents for having her, for having her as a baby. She was she sued her parents for that. I don't know if she actually won that or what came of it, but she was suing her parents for having her, and she told them, she, was, she said that they should have got a psychic or something to contact her before she was born to tell her, to tell them if she wanted to be born or not. And she did not want to be born, so she was suing them. And she was saying she wants to influence this whole generation to uh, sue their parents for having them. That way, nobody has to work. And that's just a crazy way of thinking. And that's what you've got today. This was just unheard of years ago. And another time, I heard a woman suggesting asking your child's permission before you change their diaper. And I'm thinking, this woman must not have kids because if I had to wait to, if I had to ask permission from my kids to change their diaper, their diaper would never be changed. They don't want to get their diaper changed most times. And then they just have a horrible diaper rash. And then, then you'd be in trouble for abuse. You see, this crazy way of thinking, they think so crazy like, uh, like if you bring up the drag queen story hour to someone, uh, sometimes I've I've had people be somehow justify the drag queen story hour. You know where the drag queens go in there to the libraries and public schools reading these children's books to children dressed up like a a street walker, men dressed up like street walking women reading stories to children. They'll say that. Uh, that's no different than uh, something like uh, they'll say that's no different than somebody coming to a school and you know training training them about guns, which I don't even think that that even happens that I know of. But it's like, how how is that even? How could you even use that analogy? It's not wrong to um, have guns. Gun having guns is not a sin. But being a drag queen, having that lifestyle, is always a sin. So you see how crazy they think? They say, well, well, if they could be training the kids about guns, and then the kids grow up and kill people. But what are the chances of them growing up and killing people? Sure, that could happen. But it wouldn't be the guy's fault that was coming in training them how to use a gun. But, you know, you get a drag queen coming in and you're promoting that lifestyle, acting like that sort of lifestyle is okay, then you're leading that, leading them towards the path of a, the way of the transgressor. And the way of transgressor is hard. You, you are leading them to physical harm by having a drag queen come in and read books to your children. But that's the way people think, so illogical, so crazy. And you take away the prudent, the wise men, the smart guys, the, the men that can actually think straight and logically, then you got this nation. And that's what Israel was going through. That's what this nation that you're in is going through. And then the ancient men. Isaiah talks about the ancient men. If you take away the ancient men, then you lose wisdom, you lose experience. And... There's a lot that you can get from an ancient man, somebody that's that's older, very old, and been through things. Proverbs sixteen thirty one says, "The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness." The devil wants to make you think that being old is a disaster, but it's actually a good thing. You have wisdom to give out, and if you have used all those years wisely. You have even more wisdom to give out. Isaiah 3 and verse 3. He says, the captain of 50 and the honorable man. He's going to take away, the Lord's going to take away the captain of 50 
and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. If you take away the captains, where's your leaders? Without strong men as your leaders, the captains, it, you know who it's going to go to? Not even to the weak men. Most likely it's going to go to the strong women. And a strong woman cannot replace correctly the strong man. Because God made us to have these roles. And if you can't go by those roles, then it's just going to go downhill from there. If you take away the honorable, what are you left with? The dishonorable men. And those are the men who are publicized today as the role models, the dishonorable. There's nothing honorable about these rappers that they got everywhere. On clothing in Walmart, you see rappers and on cereal boxes, on TV, on the sports shows, on the award shows, on all that stuff. You see these rappers, the dishonorable men. The athletes, just because they can dunk a basketball, they are on the fa they're the face of everything, and they have no morals. The corrupt politicians, they have no moral morals. You listen to them talk, they are dishonorable men. Men like George Floyd, all these people like this, are seen. That's who they're putting as their heroes of today. You take away the honorable, you're left with the dishonorable people as the heroes and the role models. If you take away the cutting art art artificer, you lose men that have skill as craftsmen. The cunning artificer is a metal worker. And you just don't have as you don't have as many skilled craftsmen today. Things are done with machines. <clears throat> you know, I don't even have any real skills. And things, you know, that's going out. Men don't have no real skills in anything no more. It's done with machines. Nobody knows how to do anything. And take You take away the eloquent orator. That's somebody that can talk really well, communicate really well. And, and you don't have any of them who are amazing communicators who can rep reprove and rebuke and exhort people to do things and live right and get the job done. The devil tries to get all those eloquent orders for himself. That way, he can get guys who, with good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple, like it talks about in Romans sixteen eighteen. But what you're seeing today is an agenda to eliminate and get rid of these manly men, these great men, and replace them with effeminate males and strong, manly, acting women. And weak men and strong women cannot replace the strong, mighty men. God didn't make it to be that way. And you know what this leads to? The next thing of a downfall of a nation is the wrong people in leadership. In Isaiah 3, 4, it says, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. The manly men have been eliminated. Those were the ones who would stand in the way of such nonsense in leadership. Now they have children as leaders. This is the blind leading the blind. Not just children, but overgrown babies as leaders. You see, my seven-year-old has more spiritual wisdom than the current elderly president. Now, she couldn't be president, but she's got more spiritual wisdom than the one we got now. You got children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. I don't believe he's a Christian, but even if he was, he would be a baby Christian at best. <clears throat> and you look at, after Isaiah's prophecy, at the kings that were in there, and you got some really young kings in their 20s, even before their 20s, stepping in there. It says in Isaiah 3, 5, And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. You see, everybody will oppress each other. A place full of people who are divided, every man for himself, stealing, killing, raping, trafficking. A place with the gender roles reversed, the family roles reversed, 
Nobody wants to submit to any type of authority. We have, we all have authority figures that we need to submit to. Even the men, even the strong men, have to submit to an authority, the their supervisor, a police officer. You know, we've all got authority to submit to. As a man, I need to submit to the Lord, the police, the laws of the land, my supervisors, my team leaders. We all have to submit to somebody, a pastor. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 2, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. You see that? The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. That's being disobedient to parents, disobedient to people that are older than you. <clears throat> when a man shall take hold of his brother, this is Isaiah 3, 6. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. All because who wants to be to rule a place that's going down the tubes? Do you want to take a plant manager's job at a sinking factory? Do you want to be over a nation that's about to get demolished? He says, "Let this ruin be under my under thy hand." Why would I? Why would you want to be a ruler over a nation in that situation? In Isaiah three seven, it says, "In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people." Anyone with sense knows he isn't gaining anything by becoming a ruler or leader of a nation that's going downhill. He says in Isaiah 3.12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. So women and children rule over them. Even today you have a gender reversal going on. They want the woman leading the man. They want the man as effeminate as possible. And what does it say in 1 Corinthians 6.9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterous, nor effeminate. Effeminate. Men acting like women. They want the men to act like women and the women to act like men. And the only time they want the woman to act like a woman is because they want to be able to continue to sell womanly things to them. Because it's all about the, the money. So in the movies and everywhere, what do you see? You got these female action heroes beating up grown men in their nice clothes and in their makeup and in their high heels. That's the only reason they still want you to act like a woman a little bit so they can continue to sell you the womanly stuff because they know women are just going to keep buying that. But if you lose good men, you lose good leaders. And God has it set up to where men are supposed to be the leaders. That's just the way it is. And then if you have bad leadership, the people follow they end up following the leader. You'll end up with bad people. We need an example. God gave us parents. God gave us men to follow like Paul. God came down and manifested himself in the flesh to be a pattern for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is our pattern. We need somebody to follow. You need a leader in your life to follow, a good godly leader. And the more biblical patterns and role models you have, the better off you'll be. But the downfall of a nation has the wrong people and leadership it takes away the ungodly it takes away god's going to take away the godly men and the godly leaders and as a judgment on a nation or of anything but we'll continue with isaiah chapter 3 next time the next downfall of a nation that you see in isaiah chapter 3 is people forsaking the ways and commands of god in Isaiah 3, 8, it says, For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. So Jerusalem is ruined. Ezekiel eighteen twenty says, Iniquity will be your ruin. The more you stay in sin, live for the world, the flesh, and the devil, you're ruining yourself. He said, Judah is fallen. 
Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You got too much pride to give up your sin, to, give, to get back to God. You're headed for a fall. Isaiah talks about how their doings are against the Lord. When in Colossians 1, 10, Paul says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The attitude of a Christian is, Everything that you do, you should want to be pleasing God, not everything you do going against the Lord. So Judah and Jerusalem, they got all the ingredients mixed together to blow themselves up. Psalm 917 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. They provoked the eyes of His glory. Can you imagine provoking to anger the Almighty who made heaven, who made earth, who made the sun, who made the moon, who made the stars and the galaxies, and made hell itself. Imagine that. In Isaiah 3, 9, it says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. He points out how the show of their countenance doth witness against them. You know what that means? A hard life of sin will add years to the life of your face. It's written all over your face. Like that, like that common saying, man, it's written all over your face, what you've been doing. In Jeremiah 3.3, 3, it talks about a whore's forehead. He says, thou hast, a, thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. See, a whore's not ashamed. She's out walking the streets. Dressed like a whore, acting like a whore. She's not ashamed. Who knows it? Unashamed sin going on in this country. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. Christians today are ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but they aren't ashamed of their stubborn rebellion against God. And Isaiah mentions how Judah and Jerusalem declare, they declare it, they declare their sin of Sodom. He said they hide it not. It's a big sin parade. It's a literal parading of sinful flesh. What do you think about a country that has a pride month? What do you think about a country where sodomites can dance around in women's clothes in front of your children in a public library? And these aren't just women's clothes they're wearing. It is what the Bible calls the attire of an harlot. In other words, the clothes a hooker would wear to work. If you got these men dressed up like that, dancing around in front of children and you're supposed to be okay with this because they can't help how they feel. They can't help who they love. They can't help. They were born feeling like a woman, so it's okay for them to dress up like a woman in front of your kid. As Isaiah describes their wicked countenance and says they hide it not. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? What did they do? They ran and hid. What did you do as a kid when you, got, when you did something wrong? You ran and hid. You see, it's not good to hide sin. You should confess it and forsake it. But if you're not going to forsake it, you'd cause a lot less damage by hiding it. But now, what is the sodomite all about? Coming out of the closet, the show of their countenance doth witness against them. They hide it not. Isaiah 3.10, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. This is sowing and reaping. If you sow good things, if righteous people sow good things, then they're going to reap good things. They'll eat the fruit of their doings. But if you sow bad things, look at verse 11. It says, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. All you're doing, living wickedly, is you're heaping up treasure, chests of ruin. Iniquity will be your ruin. You're heaping up treasure, chests of ruin with your sin. And men treat sin like a competition. They treat sin like it's a good thing to be the baddest. So they will get their reward. In Galatians 6, through 9, 6, 7 through 9, it says, Be not deceived. Don't let the devil deceive you. Don't let your flesh deceive you. Don't let the world deceive you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You see, don't be deceived. The next time you go to do a, a sin that you know that you're not supposed to be doing, remember, you're sowing to the flesh corruption, and you're going to reap corruption. He that liveth for the flesh shall die. This is a downfall of a nation when people forsake and forget all about the commands of God. It's not one nation under God. It's one nation that's forsaken God. The next thing, the downfall of a nation, is the Lord saying, It is enough. Isaiah 3.13 says, The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord is the judge of all the earth. In Genesis 16.25, that's what Abraham calls him. He calls him the judge of all the earth. He says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The judge of all the earth does do right. So when he brings judgment on a nation, a people, on an organization, or anything, he is doing right. In Isaiah 3.14, it says, The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. He says, For ye have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. So they're oppressing the poor. And they've eaten up the vineyard. His vineyard is the house of Israel, according to a few chapters later, Isaiah 5, 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the spoil of the poor was in these rich people's houses. The spoil is what is the good you take after, you know, a war or robbing somebody. They were oppressing the poor people just like they're going to do in the tribulation. In Isaiah 3.15 it says, What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? He said, What mean ye by this? Many times I've heard people say the phrase, What do you mean? When you're doing something wrong or stepping out of bounds, they say, What do you mean by all this? Or what's the meaning of this? It's almost like, Who do you even think you are? That's what God's saying. What gives you the right to think you can hurt anybody? But they're bearing... They're beating them to pieces and grinding their faces. So the Lord comes back to break some to pieces and grind, grind some to powder. In Daniel 2.34, Thou sawest till us that a stone was cut without hands. Jesus is a stone cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were iron of clay, iron and clay, and break them to pieces. In Matthew 21.44, it says, And whosoever shall fall, on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So he's coming to break them to pieces. He's coming to grind them to powder. Because that's what they were doing. When people forsake the Lord and forget his commands, the Lord says, it is enough. And he comes back. And that's the downfall of a nation. The next thing, the haughty spirit of the people is the downfall of a nation. Isaiah 3.16 Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, they're so just stuck on themselves, think they're better than everybody, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. He got on to the men for not being men. Now he gets on the women for their haughtiness. If, if someone is haughty, then they are proud, they got a high opinion of themselves, therefore they get these stretched forth necks. Just look at the NBA players before the game walking down the tunnel and how cocky they act. It's disgusting. Look at, go to the mall and you see these fancy people walking around with these stretched forth necks, thinking they're so great. So, so much sometimes that they start to look like those women in Africa. You know, they got those weird looking rings on their neck and it's, makes their neck look really long. That's what these people are like. That's how far out their neck is stretched. They think that they're so great. They got wanton eyes. It's got them looking around with immoral desires, wondering who's looking at me. All this is all this attention on me. They don't just walk. They are mincing as they go, Isaiah says. Basically meaning they take short steps and move in a certain way to draw attention to the flesh. They got those wanton eyes. They're looking around, wanting you to look. He says they make a tinkling with their feet. 
probably with the ornaments of the legs that verse Isaiah 3.20 talks about. Something like an ankle bracelet that makes a lot of noise or something like that to draw attention to their self, draw attention to the flesh, get you to lust after them. You know, Jesus said, if a man look upon a woman to lust after her, he'd committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if a woman is dressed immodestly, then she plays a role in that. In Isaiah 3.17, it says, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. A scab. The Lord will smite with a scab. A scab like leprosy. Makes sense because Leviticus, remember the third book of the Bible, lining up with Isaiah chapter 3, the chapter we're studying right now. In Leviticus 13, 2, it talks about a leper having a scab. You see, they walked around like they had a crown on their head, so he smites the crown on their head with a scab. The Lord will discover their secret parts. You see, they will be exposed for what they really are. They had been walking around like not leaving much to the imagination with, you know, half-naked clothes on, basically showing everything but their secret parts. Now the Lord says, okay, I will discover your secret parts. We'll see who you really are. So that haughty spirit is a downfall of a nation. Another downfall of a nation is the parading of the flesh and the aff affections on the earthly things. You see, you get a bunch of women walking around half naked all the time, not leaving much to the imagination. You see it everywhere on TV, on billboards, and in your face at work, in your face at church. Pretty much, you men quit caring so much about women and they go after other men because you know they left nothing to the imagination it doesn't excite them anymore and <clears throat> you can read in history where that's happened women start dressing like whores all the time what happens the men end up going after other men and what was the sins of Sodom pride fullness of bread abundance of idleness that's what you've got today. In Isaiah 3.18, it says, In that day, remember, note the phrase in that day, In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. Notice that phrase, in that day. It puts you in a tribulation, second coming, and millennium context. Every time you see that phrase, in that day or the day of the Lord. This shows you this isn't just history you're reading about. This is prophecy. He is going to take away the bravery. In this sense, their bravery is not a good thing. You see, it's good to be brave for God, but it's not good to be brave against God. It just shows they have no fear of the Lord. He's going to take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments because it's awful brave of them to walk around parading themselves like they are God's gift to the world. Their cause is like a net for their head. Their round tires, it talks about it's probably a big flashy hat. You see, it's all about looking good. It puts you in mind of a car because it talks about tires and it's about to talk about mufflers. Women are compared to cars, if you think about it. You know, you, you got a guy, a guy can be talking about his vehicle and say, man, isn't she a beauty? Or he calls her his car a her. And it's also what do they put next to the nice cars in the magazines? Women that are dressed just like Isaiah 3 is describing. So it makes sense that it kind of reminds you of a car. He says in Isaiah 319, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, chains are like necklaces. Mufflers are like a scarf that goes around the, the neck and lower face and bracelets for the wrist. All this, they're, they're doing it for the purpose of drawing attention to the flesh is it, it isn't that these things are bad it is that they are par priding themselves in these things parading themselves in these things trying to draw attention to themselves he says in isaiah 320 the bonnets you know like for the head and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings ornaments ornaments of the legs it's not like the ornaments for a Christmas tree. It's something they put on their legs 
so that you would know when they were coming and it would draw attention to them. Kind of like how high heels will many times draw attention when they walk by loudly, mincing as they go, as it said. He said tablets, they're tablets. Seems to be like a little flat object that would hang from a necklace or bracelet or earring. In Isaiah 321, it says the rings and nose jewels. Once again, obviously jewelry in and of itself isn't wrong. But are you priding yourself in your jewelry? Are you parading the flesh with your jewelry? In 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, he says, Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You want the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. You don't want the ornaments of the legs that you're adorning yourself with. You want your adorning to be the hidden man of the heart. You want to be about God. You don't want to be just all about this material affection on earthly things. You see, it says, Who's adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold. It's not that wearing of gold is bad, just like the next thing says, or of putting on of apparel. If you didn't put on apparel, you'd, you wouldn't have any clothes on. So it's not that these things are wrong. It's that you're adorning yourself. You're making yourself all about your stuff when you should be all about God. In Isaiah 3, it says, The changeable suits of apparel. You're just adorning yourself and your changeable suits of apparel. That's all you're about. And the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins. Changeable suits of apparel. They have so many clothes, they could wear something new every day. And it's all for the purpose of drawing attention to them. The mantles, that's like a loose sleeveless coat. The wimples is a, a headdress attached to a hat that fastens under the chin. The crisping pins, that's their curling irons. Once again, not bad, but do you spend more time on your hair than you do for the Lord? Isaiah 3.23, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be stink, and instead of a girdle a rent, and instead of a well-set hair baldness. And instead of a stomach or a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. So the glasses, perhaps a, like a mirror. It's like a man beholdeth his natural face in a glass, as James talks about. And all they care about is what they see on the outside. But they're not worried about what's on the inside. They spend a lot of time looking in the mirror, the glasses, and, fine, and the fine linen. Are you concerned with your fine linen, the clothes that you're wearing, the hoods, the veils, what's on your head, what's covering your face? But he says, it shall come to pass, and instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent, and instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. A stomacher is a tri like a triangular piece of material that covers the stomach and abdomen, and he says, instead of a sweet smell, there shall be stink. Once again, Leviticus, third book of the Bible, matching Isaiah chapter 3, Leviticus talks about how he will no longer smell the savor of their sweet odors. Leviticus 26, 31, And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries into desolation, and I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. He's done smelling your perfume that you're using to just get over attention for the flesh. Leviticus actually says the word savor 17 times. Imagine going from dressing like a rich supermodel to stinking like a homeless man. Imagine going from wearing nice clothes to having girdles that are rent, like torn. Imagine going from having well-set hair, beautiful hair, that men love to look at, to just baldness. Sometimes hitting rock bottom is the only way to get someone's attention. And many times in the Bible when someone is in mourning, they rent their clothes. Instead of a girdle, a rent. 
Instead of walking around in nice clothes, they're going to be in mourning, tearing their clothes. He says in Isaiah 3.25, Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty win, mighty in the war. The Lord can have all your real men killed off. Then you're really shot. Then the women and children have to take over. Because the weak men will turn out to be the weaker vessels. In Isaiah 3.26, And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Instead of the partying and celebrating and living in bliss and she being in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Instead of all that stuff, she's now lamenting. Now she's mourning. Now she's grieving. Now she's weeping. Now she's wailing. Now she's desolate. Meaning the city becomes without inhabitant. She shall sit up on the ground. Just like Job did when he had those boils that he scraped off with a posture. They started out with their head in the clouds. And now the Lord has brought them down low to the ground. This is the downfall of a nation. 